Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well. Today we're going to work on the last two scenes of Act 3. You needed to read scenes 3 and 4. The last scene that you read on your own was the famous banquet scene where Macbeth sees the, um, the shadow or the ghost of Banquo and that really speaks to where his mind is going. And we'll talk about the state of mind of both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth later on in the unit. But for the purposes of what I would like us to focus on today, I want to continue with this idea of the recurring themes. So we spoke last time on Monday, the idea of fate versus free will and how Macbeth is trying to manipulate his fate and do anything possible to make sure that that prophecy the witches gave Banquo that his sons will become kings does not come true. So what we're going to see in scene five is the appearance of a new witch and I spoke to you briefly yesterday when I gave you the overview of the background notes for act three. We're going to meet Hecate today and I'll talk to you a little bit about what she symbolizes and then we'll get into the scenes. Today I want us to figure out how the appearance of these witches helps to foreshadow the consequences that Macbeth may face as he attempts again to defy fate. So if you take a look on your screen, I'm giving you two images here that depict the Greek goddess Hecate. And I just want you to take a look at them um, and try and see what are some of the things that jump out at you. So if Hecate is supposed to be one goddess, in both of these pictures, obviously you'll be able to see that there are three women. And it's almost the idea of this three in one. Take a look at what all three images of this one person um, have on their heads and what they're holding. Take a look at their facial expressions. So this Greek goddess Hecate um, is going to be the, the fourth witch that we're going to encounter in Macbeth. Um, this idea of the supernatural is an important theme in the story. For us though, when we think about witches or when we see these witches come up in the story of Macbeth, it may not be all that important or it may not be all that significant because in our society we really don't believe in this. However, we have to consider um, Shakespeare's audience at the time. So if you take a look at these two images again, they present Hecate not as one but as three. The three different personas look very different from one another. They have different hats or uh, emblems on their heads, facial expressions, and they're also holding different things. This could perhaps be the different personalities, the different sides of this particular goddess. Um, perhaps she's devious. Perhaps she can also be this uh, goddess or, or the person who, who gives light, who can illuminate the way for you. Or maybe what it is in her holding fire, she wants to be feared and she might be someone that is dangerous. We're going to be able to decide as we progress throughout the play. But again, bringing you back to this idea of the supernatural, it is a prominent, it's an important theme in the play, and we have to um, analyze the different ways that it appears in the story. So in terms of the supernatural, if you look down here, supernatural is something beyond logical or scientific understanding, something that defies the laws of nature. And again, in the play, we've already seen this play out. Again, in the beginning with the witches giving Banguo and Macbeth these prophecies. We also see Macbeth with the vision of the dagger right before he has to go in and kill King Duncan. And then in the last scene that you read with Banquo's ghost. So it's prominent. In other words, it's reoccurring throughout the story. Therefore, the idea of the supernatural must be important. So perhaps all of the events in the play so far have been controlled and manipulated by the witches. Maybe Lady Macbeth isn't the one manipulating her husband Macbeth. Maybe it's the witches. Remember that Lady Macbeth called upon these spirits to unsex her and allow her to act like a man. So some background information 
about uh, the scene five that we're going to get into. For the first time, again, we're going to be introduced to the character Hecate. In Greek mythology, she was the goddess of the night, of witchcraft, of the moon, of being able to bring people back from the dead. In this scene, she is presented as superior to the three witches. So we have to see her almost like their boss. And she's going to come in very angry with the witches because they have proceeded with the plan to manipulate Macbeth without involving her. So this idea that the witches were supposed to tell Macbeth what was going to what was going to happen to him that he was going to be king is something that Hecate is frowning upon. So again, keeping in line with the context um, in which this uh, the story was written, King James is ruling, and the attitude towards the witches is very different from our beliefs during this time. So again, while today we see witches as stereotypical, even comedic uh, reliefs, um, sometimes again they're being depicted with green skin and broomsticks like we see in The Wizard of Oz, um, you have to keep in mind that during Shakespeare's time, people were very fearful of the witches. King James, again, who is the king, when Macbeth was written and performed, believed in witches. So much so that he wrote a, an 80-page book about them, which he entitled Demonology. And there's a picture of the actual book on the right. King James, like many people in England at the time, suspected of people being witches. And if you were deemed to be a witch, then you were killed. And during that time, a lot of innocent people were, were killed. So historians believe that the so many witches who were tried and killed during Shakespeare's time, um, their records aren't even kept because there were so many. So in this context, bringing us back to the story, we have to see Hecate and the witches in Macbeth as um, imposing fear on the audience. So if you were watching this during King James's time and you saw Hecate appear on stage with the three witches, you knew that this wasn't going to end very well. So let's take a look at the scene together, and as we read, I want us to think about the appearance of the witches and how that helps to foreshadow Macbeth's uh, consequences for trying to defy fate, for trying to go away from what the witches have prophesied. Let's take a look at it. Okay, so if you have your script, you can turn to page 41. That's where we'll find the beginning of scene five of act three. So again, you had to read the famous banquet scene uh, where Macbeth believes that he is looking at Banquo's ghost. And scene five then brings us to the witches. So again, even reminding you about the structural choices that Shakespeare made when um, putting this play together, he goes from a very serious scene where uh, the audience can clearly see that Macbeth is, is losing his mind to then uh, the appearance of the witches. And this, again, would cause the audience to, to become fearful. So here we're going to be introduced to Hecate, and I want you to notice that thunder is what causes Hecate to enter. It says there's thunder, and then the three witches enter to meet Hecate. Okay, so I want us to associate this idea of thunder with Hecate. Let's take a look at it. Why, how now, Hecate? You look angrily. Have I not reason, bell dams as you are? Saucy and overbold, how did you dare to trade and traffic with Macbeth in riddles and affairs of death? And I, the mistress of your charms, the close contriver of all harms, was never called to bear my part or show the glory of our art. So I'm going to stop here just to kind of reiterate some of the things that Hecate is uh, is questioning. So the first witch says, you know, what's wrong, Hecate? Why do you look so angry? 
and she says, Don't I have reason to be angry, you disobedient hags? How dare you give Macbeth riddles and prophecies about his future without telling me? I am your boss and the source of your powers. So this allows us to understand that Hecate does have um, power over the witches. I am your boss and the source of your powers. So the three witches cannot operate without Hecate. So they obviously did this behind her back, or so they believe, because out of the blue, Hecate is aware of what they did. She says, I am the one who secretly decides what evil things happen, but you never called me to join you and show off my own powers. So the fact that Hecate wasn't able to show Macbeth how powerful she is, is one of the motivating reasons as to why she's angry. She goes on and she says, and what's worse, you've done all this for a man who behaves like a spoiled brat, angry and hateful. So now Hecate is going to point out some of Macbeth's downfalls, okay, some of his flaws. He's a spoiled brat, he's angry, and he's hateful. So before we continue, I want to um, annotate that. So let me actually bring um, this annotation here for us. And we'll write it here on the side. Okay. So Hecate is angry that she was not a part of the witches reveal, um, revealing Macbeth's future. And here she points out, Hecate points out Macbeth's flaws. So two things that we're making a note of. Okay. So let's continue on. We stopped here at line nine. A witch is worse. All you have done have been but for a wayward son, spiteful and wrathful, who, as others do, loves for his own ends, not for you. But make amends now. Get you gone, and at the pit of Acheron, meet me in the morning. Thither he will come to know his destiny. Your vessels and your spells provide, your charms and everything beside. I am for the air. This night I'll spend unto a dismal and a fatal end. Great business must be wrought ere noon. Upon the corner of the moon there hangs a vaporous drop profound. I'll catch it ere it come to ground, and that, distilled by magic slights, shall raise such artificial sprites as by the strength of their illusion shall draw him on to his confusion. So let's stop here to see exactly what Hecate is planning. So I'm going to bring us up a little bit. We left off here based on um, pointing out Macbeth's flaws. Then she continues on and she says, Like all spoiled sons, he chases after what he wants and doesn't care about you. But you can make it up to me. Go away now and in the morning meet me in the pit by the river in hell. Macbeth will go there to learn his destiny. So here... Hecate is aware of what Macbeth is going to do. Macbeth is going to meet the witches again to learn what is going to come of his new destiny. If the prophecy was that Banquo's sons will become kings, what's going to happen now? Banquo is dead. So it says, you bring your cauldrons, your spells, your charms, and everything else. I'm about to fly away. I'll spend tonight working to make something horrible happen. So I'm going to highlight this as well, because this then alludes back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the lesson, whether or not the witches allow things to happen, whether they're responsible for some of the events that occur. So I'm going to, I guess I have to leave it here. So are the witches 
responsible for Macbeth's actions? Do they cause him to act as he is? As he is acting. That's a better way to say it. She says, I have a lot to do before noon. An important droplet is hanging from the corner of the moon. I'll catch it before it falls to the ground. When I work it over with magic spells, the drop will produce magical spirits that will trick Macbeth with illusions. So I'm going to uh, highlight this part here as well because this is an important part of the plot. In essence, what Hecate is telling us is that she is going to cause Macbeth to, um, to be struck with these illusions. So here we have the theme of appearance versus reality again, right? That was one of the first themes that we spoke about. It also plays into the idea that Macbeth may be tricked with visions or things that are not true or really there. And we saw this already begin to play out with the banquet scene where he thought he was looking at Banquo's ghost. So again, this is going to be Hecate's plan to bring Macbeth to her and then shape his, uh, his destiny different from what the three witches had prophesied before. Um, had Kate was involved. So let's see how this scene ends. She has a few more lines um, before she leaves. So we'll pick up right here at line 30. He shall spurn fate, scorn death, and bear his hopes above wisdom, grace, and fear. And you all know security is mortal's chiefest enemy. Come away. Hark! Come away. I am called. My little spirit, see, sits in a poppy cloud and stays for me. I come with all the speed I may. I come, I come, I come. I come with all the speed I may. I come, I come, I come. Um, let's make haste. She'll soon be back again. So notice at the end of the scene, we had that thunder. Again, anytime we see thunder, we're going to associate it now with Hecate. And this is the, the consequence of that Hecate wishes to fall on Macbeth. Because he is going to try and defy fate, uh, defy his destiny, she says he's going to be fooled into thinking that he is greater than fate. He will mock death. In other words, he's going to believe that uh, death cannot uh, take him. And he is going to think that he is wiser, uh, has more grace, and is fearless. So in other words, he's going to be overconfident. Okay, And so that's uh, important for us to, to note. This is what is going to cause Macbeth's downfall. Okay. Now, as Hecate enters, I'm um, sorry, she leaves, she exits, there is this chant. And again, if we were watching this during Shakespeare's time, this chant would be very scary for us. Um, and it's, again, part of Shakespeare's structural choices for the play. So the witches are going to meet Macbeth um, at the... Um, would they say at the at the pool, um, and that is where he's going to learn his uh, his fate. So quickly, then we move into scene six, where we have Lennox speaking to another lord, and here you um, we already know that Macbeth is the new king, um, but they're going to be talking about him in secret. And so I want you to think about this idea of uh, totalitarian um, dictatorship, if you will. And think back to what we learned when we were talking about censorship and even when we were talking about night. Usually whenever you have people uh, in a country or, 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 
or in an area that's being controlled by a, uh, a totalitarian government, they're fearful of speaking out against them. And so this is what's happening with Lennox as he is speaking about Macbeth. At this point, no one knows exactly where Malcolm and Donovan, King Duncan's sons, are, and they should really be the ones who are um, are in control of the country. They're the ones who should be king, at least uh, Malcolm. But because they have fled, everyone believes, as per Macbeth, that they are responsible for their, their father's death, and therefore they have crowned Macbeth king. Let's take a look at what Lennox says, and we'll then trace how uh, the witch's uh, prophecy over Macbeth, over his downfall, plays into this scene. My former speeches have but hit your thoughts, which can interpret farther. Only I say things have been strangely born. The gracious Duncan was pitied of Macbeth. Mary, he was dead. And the right valiant Banquo walked too late, whom you may say, if to please you, Fleance killed for Fleance fled. So. Men must not walk too late. Who cannot want the thought how monstrous it was for Malcolm and for Donald Bain to kill their gracious father? Damn it fact, how it did grieve Macbeth. Did he not straight in pious rage the two delinquents tear that were the slaves of drink and thralls of sleep? Was not that nobly done? Aye, and wisely, too, for it would have angered any heart alive to hear the men deny it, so that I say he has borne all things well. And I do think that had he Duncan's sons under his key, as and please heaven he shall not, they should find what twere to kill a father, so should Fleance, but peace. For from broad words, and cause he failed his presence at the tyrant's feast, I hear Macduff lives in disgrace. Sir, can you tell where he bestows himself? So let's kind of recap what Lennox is saying. It seems fairly favorable towards Macbeth. He says, uh, what I've already said shows you we think alike, so you can draw your own conclusions. All I'm saying is that strange things have been going on. Macbeth pitied Duncan after he saw him dead, and Banquo went out walking really late at night. If you'd like, we can also say that Fleance must have killed him because he fled the scene of the crime. So Lennox is saying it looks like both the sons of both Duncan and Banquo have something to do with their father's death because Apparently, they both fled, and the only one who feels badly that this happened is Macbeth. He says, really, the lesson learned here is that you shouldn't be walking out late at night. You can get killed. Um, then he goes and he says, uh, wasn't it no uh, loyal of Macbeth to kill the two servants, the two guards, right away while they were still drunk and asleep? I think it was the right thing to do. I think it was actually very wise. Um, he says, considering all of this, I think Macbeth has handled things well, and if he had Duncan's sons in prison, which I hope won't happen, they would find out how awful the punishment is for those who kill their fathers, and so would Fleance. So here Lennox seems to believe, for a moment, that Macbeth has been acting as any normal person should. He's defending the king, and all things point to the sons of both Duncan and Banquo as responsible for their father's death. But he does make a note that it does seem very odd that everything has been happening fairly quickly. So he says, enough of that. I have heard that Macduff has fallen out of favor with the king. Here, the king is now Macbeth. So we need to make a note of that. So the king is Macbeth. So something has happened where Macduff and Macbeth are not in good terms. And so he's asking, do you know where he is? Because he failed to show up to Macbeth's feast. Can you tell me where he's hiding himself? And take a look at what the Lord says about where Macduff, Malcolm, and Donovan are. The son of Duncan, 
from whom this tyrant holds the due of birth, lives in the English court, and is received of the most pious Edward with such grace that the malevolence of fortune nothing takes from his high respect. Thither Macduff is gone to pray the holy king upon his aid to wake Northumberland and warlike Seward, that by the help of these, with him above to ratify the work, we may again give to our tables meat, sleep to our nights, free from our feasts and banquets, bloody knives, do faithful homage and receive free honors, all which we pine for now. And this report has so exasperated the king that he prepares for some attempt of war. Okay. So here we learn that Malcolm is, uh, that everyone, well, at least the Lord knows, that Malcolm is in England, and he is trying to get the King of England, King Edward, to join forces with him to come back to Scotland and fight for his, uh, for his throne. He says that he is the rightful heir to, uh, to the throne, right, whose birthright and throne Macbeth has stolen. And we also learn that Macduff went there to ask for that help from King Edward. He says, Macduff hopes that with their help and with the help of God above, he may once again put food on our tables, bring peace back to our knights, free our feast and banquets from violent murders, and allow us to pay proper homage to our king and receive honors freely. So I want us to, or I'm going to highlight this for us, because it's important to note the condition of uh, the, the country once Macbeth has been king. Okay, so this is the condition of Scotland. The current condition of Scotland under Macbeth's rule. So nobody is at peace. There, a lot of people have been dying, and it's very violent. So much so that Macbeth knows Macduff is trying to uh, to come back and fight for uh, Malcolm's uh, crown, his throne, and so he is preparing for war. And when Duncan died, they were at peace. Right, the two wars had been fought and won, and there was no more war. However, this quickly changed now that Macbeth is, um, is the king. So take a look at how this scene ends. Sent he to Macduff, he did, and with an absolute sir, not I. The cloudy messenger turns me his back and hums, as who should say, you'll rue the time that clogs me with this answer. And that well might advise him to a caution to hold what distance his wisdom can provide. Some holy angel fly to the court of England and unfold his message ere he come that a swift blessing may soon return to this our suffering country under a hand accursed. I'll send my prayers with him. Okay, and that brings us to the end of Act 3. So we see that Macbeth has asked uh, Macduff to return and he told Macbeth's messenger that uh, he will not. He said, no way. And so the messenger on behalf of Macbeth says, you'll regret the day you gave me this answer. Now Lennox, who in the beginning of the scene was saying that it was understandable how Macbeth had acted um, to defend the, the, the king and, and, and kill those that uh, that went against the king, he now calls him a tyrant. And he says, some holy angels should go to the court of England and give Macduff a message. In other words, to keep fighting for, for Scotland. That's the message. He should return quickly to free our country, which is suffering under a tyrant. So this tyrant here is Macbeth. And so all the Lord has to say is, I'll send my prayers with him. So Macbeth is preparing for war. And if I bring us back to the previous scene, scene six, his downfall, according to Hecate, is going to be believing that he can mock death 
and that he is nothing to fear. His overconfidence is going to be his greatest enemy. And at this point, at the end of Act 3, Macbeth believes that if Macduff is going to uh, come against him, is going to fight against him, Macbeth will be able to win. So this brings us to the end of Act 3. I want us to talk about Macbeth's possible downfalls.